So glad to be here with you today. My name is John, and I'm up here in a slightly different capacity than you normally see me in. Next week, I will be back in regular scheduled programming. But today, I'm getting to the honor of bringing the word uh, this morning. And as I've said over the last several weeks, I am the creative arts pastor here, and that none of you know what that means. So let me introduce myself. So as a part of the team here, I get to lead worship, but as a part of my uh, role as well, I lead our tech team who is doing a great job in the back, who serves you faithfully all of the time. I get to lead a lot of our marketing as well, and anything that kind of falls under that title of creative falls under my purview here. I have a beautiful wife who generally is working out at guest services and leads our host team, um, but she is not here today because she has to work. So she is at home you know, helping people get organs and stuff. Um, I also have my two beautiful kids who are amazing, and uh, I love them, and I think they're in the back because I see my parents here, so they were hanging out with them this week. So, um, so that's just you know a little bit about me. I've been doing this kind of tech church thing for a very long time. You know, I went to Asbury College uh, right down the road. I guess it's Asbury University now as a media major. So this is kind of, this stuff is normal to me. Um, and today, I get to do something different. I get to, to, to bring the word every now and then, and I enjoy doing it. Um, and we've been in these, this series called Unfiltered. And we've been talking about a lot about social media and all that. And it turns out I am right there at an age that is in between some generations. Now, I would let you guess how old I am. I need you to also keep in mind that there are bouncers ready to bounce you <laughs> if you should say something that I do not find appealing. Um, but I'm right there in the middle between some generations. If you look at different uh, surveys and whatnot, some would put me as an elder millennial some would put me as a baby Gen Xer. I much prefer the term Xenial. It's right there in the middle. And if you go read the definition of a Xenial on any platform you find, we are the best generation. Just, I'm sorry, that's honest truth. But we find ourselves right there in the middle. I was, one of the things I saw said, we were too young for Voltron, but slightly too old for Power Rangers. I love them both. Um, I can ride in cursive. I can drive a stick shift. I first dialed into the internet, dialed in. You know the sound. The sound is playing in your head right now. You know the sound. And no one could get on the phone because then you'd get kicked off. I never had an AOL email address. I had Juno. I had Juno, y'all. So I am right there in the middle, but I'm also young enough that a lot of these technologies that came along, I can quickly grasp. So I went to school, like I said, for media communications, and a lot of this stuff just has become naturally because I've kind of grown up into it. I was old enough to get a hold of it pretty quickly. I am still my mother's tech support. Even if I can't see what she's talking about, but I'm still that, so I've learned a lot of that, and social media started somewhere in the midst. I actually had already, and once again, I'm telling you now my age, I had just a year or so already graduated college when Facebook started. So I didn't have a college email address, a .edu, that you had to have to get into Facebook. Yes, you, had, you could only get into Facebook if you had a .edu address at the time. So along the way, you know, so all these social media start popping up, and it used to be a thing that it was, everybody was a part of it. I was heavy into it for a very long time. I've worked for social media marketing companies. I've been regularly in charge of marketing efforts. A lot of my background is in graphic design and marketing, so I've done all of that along with social media, and all the churches I've served as a part of under my purview as a creative arts pastor has been marketing and making social media work for the church. But honestly, if it wasn't a part of my job, I probably would quit. Because at the end of the day, social media has become, while it's got all these great pieces to it, and you can find all the stats in the world that you want to find. 
you'll find the ones that say how much more the world is connected, and we see that all of the time. It's a great opportunity to learn how people that you may not have been able to talk to for a long time, people that you may have lost touch with. There's people that I haven't seen since college <clears throat> years ago that I can still connect with on social media and see how they're doing. There's great things about it. But at the end of the day, a lot of social media is just a really good place to hide. And how we end up using it is we start showing people the best of us. We only show the best that we put out, and we see everybody else's best, and we assume that everything is great in their world as well. It's also a great way to hide on the other way. We assume an anonymity. You can go on social media or, let's be honest, your text messaging, and type whatever vitriol you want to put in there, and then just go, I'm done. You never have to have a real conversation with anybody. You never have to look at anybody in the eye and talk to them. You never have to get into their shoes a little bit because you can just sit behind your keyboard and just do whatever. And there's so many reports out there that talk about how social media affects our, our uh, identity, how it affects how we feel about ourselves, how, we, how it affects our self-worth. What filters are you always trying to put on? What questions are you always, like, how are you wanting to appear? It's so easy to just put that out there and then go, how many likes did I get? And you wait for that dopamine hit. You wait for somebody else to tell you how great you are, how lovely your children are, how wonderful you are, how you've done just all these great things. And we do that in this massive cycle. And then if we don't do what's as good as somebody else, we've got to figure it out. I remember very distinctly looking at uh, some photos of a friend of mine, and they're doing well for themselves. His wife is a lawyer, and when they first got married, the number of times I saw them in Aruba blew my mind. I'm like, who can fly to Aruba four times a year? I don't understand. They're just living this wonderful life. I could never have that. I'm a pastor and a musician. I ain't ever going to make a dime, y'all. How are they doing this? How are they just getting to do that? And you could find yourselves jealous so quickly and spending all of this time spinning your wheels and at the same time getting to see lovely babies of friends that, that were born that you don't get to see. They live across the country and all this other stuff. So it's a love-hate relationship with it. There's a lot of good that it can do. And there's a lot of bad that it can do. So while we've been talking about social media, we've actually been talking more about us, our internal. First we can talking about your authenticity. Who are you really? Last week on Compassion, when you see someone post something that they are hurting, does it move you? Does it move you to compassion? Does it move you to want to reach out beyond just changing your graphic on your social media page? Does it move you to action? Because compassion is love in action. So I want to ask you this question. Let's move again away from the technology itself for a moment. And let's look at ourselves. Where do you find your worth? Where do you find your worth? What do you let identify you? Do you live in the freedom of who you really are? Or does your mood fluctuate with that number of likes? Does your mood fluctuate with whether somebody tells you thank you or not? Does your mood fluctuate with whether or not you are able to keep up with what you're seeing from everybody else? Are you content with what you have or are you wrecked by FOMO? For all of you who are older than I am, that means fear of missing out. Are you wrecked by all of that? These questions have plagued us for longer than social media has existed. It's just amplified them. So who are you? And where is your worth found? And that's what we want to deal with today. So I'm going to show you some pictures from my own personal social media for a second, okay? So... Let's get up picture number one. This is me and my kids. This is, Gavin was probably about two or three months old here. 
This is while we were living in Cincinnati. We had just moved up there, and I was a stay-at-home dad. Ooh. Some people are made for it, some are not. And you look at that picture, and you see us hanging out. You see me smiling. And I was struggling heavily with depression. I was, I was probably at one of the most broken periods in my time. Shal and I were struggling. Uh, everything had blown up at the church that we had long, gone up there to launch a campus for. I'm at home with these two kids. And while my son now is super chill, as a baby, he was a basket case. <laughs> he was either asleep or screaming bloody murder. And I did everything I could not to throw him through a window. But it's in that scenario that that photo happens. In part of the worst period of my, of my life. Was I talking to anybody? Was I seeing any, anything other than what was the circumstances? I, but I was trying to put out that. Oh, look at me and my kids. Let's go to the next one. This is, we had just moved to uh, North Carolina. I can tell you the date of this photo is July 3rd, 2016. This was the Sunday. We had just pulled in and moved into our apartment on the Saturday. We were about to head over to this new church that we were going to part of that I had started interviewing process with, and that was a giant cluster, as it were. It was a terrible interview process. It led to all kinds of awful things. That, this is out of the two, seat, the two years of just hard in Cincinnati, coming into this, thinking maybe we're going to start afresh and all this other stuff but hard, and it led to hard for still another year. But, hey, happy family, so excited about new, new of what's in front of us. Everything's great. And if you've paid attention to those two photos closely at all, you'll notice I'm bigger in this one than I was in the one previously. So now I'm going to show you the third one. And here we are, all dressed up, with my wife looking great, me dressed up in this suit, and smiling and everything like that. What you don't know about this photo that got posted, that's shirt number four. That's a suit that I bought from DXL. That's me at my absolute heaviest and hating it. And after this picture was taken and posted, we climbed in the car, the button snapped on the shirt, and I had to go find a new one again. I was so tired. And I sucked it up and smiled and went to these parties, had another one the next week. This was all for Shao's work because she has a, a far more lucrative job than I, I do. She is far smarter than I am. And I sucked it up the next week. I said, I'm not wearing this suit again. Went and found, found some sweater, did something else that I needed to dress up for. And it's like, I still struggle with my weight now. I, at some point, I lost a ton of it. it was, this was about five or six months before um, I started into a pretty heavy weight loss journey. But this is social media. This is what we do with it. And while I was looking for something to make me feel better, something to tell me, you know, I'm, I'm okay, let's post a photo. And I am struggling and in some deep depression. It was actually Probably around this time, actually it was a little bit before this, that I actually started seeing a counselor for depression myself and dealing with some of the things in my life. And we spend a lot of time thinking and looking at photos like that and looking through social media and believing that the grass is greener on the other side. It's the lie we operate in. But at the end of the day, the grass is actually, this is the title of my sermon, the grass is actually kind of brownish. And if it is greener on the other side, it's covered in a whole lot of, let's call it manure. <laughs> Things do not look like what we want to post. And if that's where we're trying to get our identity, if that's where we're find, trying to find our comfort, if that's where we're trying to figure out who we are, you may get that dopamine hit every now and then, but you're going to find yourself lost five minutes later. We have to find a different way to get that. There's a different way internally that we have to find in who we are. James chapter 4 says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war and take it away from them. 
yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. We spend an inordinate amount of time trying to make people believe that we are better than we actually are, coupled with trying to reach these standards, trying to do all of this thing. We only show people what we want to see, and it's a vicious cycle that we just fall into. And if somebody's doing better than us, we got to try harder. We got to keep doing this. It's the only way we're going to feel better about ourselves. And like James said, we end up becoming someone we never intended to be because we find ourselves steeped in jealousy and striving for worth in what we have or what someone else says about us. So I want to help us. And this is something that I spend a whole lot of time on. Um, It's something that even after I gave my life to Christ, we're going to be vulnerable today, y'all. Let's talk for a second. So I am a black man. If you didn't know, hey, look at that. I got all this extra melanin over a lot of you in this room. And I've spent the majority of my life surrounded by white folk. And I spent the majority of my life having my white friends in youth group tell me that I wasn't black enough and calling me this Oreo inside your white blah, 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 blah. I no longer accept that joke, by the way. I also had all the black people around me telling me I wasn't black enough, I wasn't good enough to be around them because I didn't act like they did. So I struggled with my own identity from day one. And even after I gave my life to Christ, I still struggled. I used to have this recurring nightmare that would happen, and I knew I was going to happen as soon as I closed my, close my eyes to lay down. Now, some of you aren't going to understand this dream because, once again, it ages me. You remember an old CRTV when it didn't actually get a, a channel, and it had that gray and black and that white and black just fuzz, static. As soon as I would close my eyes, this static would happen. And it was like a giant ball from the Temple of Doom just like rolling after me that I could never get away from this confusion until the Lord said to me, you're mine. Until the Lord set me straight and after I gave my life to Christ and continued to struggle with it, I've not had that dream since that day. That he said, you are a proud black man that I created. You are my son that I put here in this way, to be this way, to look this way, to act this way, to do as I say. That's when my life transformed. There is no amount of words or more about, uh, amount of struggling to get more that could have done what those words did to me that day. And I've not struggled with that mentality issue since. And today, I hope that some of you can break loose from that same pattern, from that same issue. Because the first thing I want to say is your identity is not formed by your circumstances. Your identity is not formed by your circumstances, by what's happening around you, whether good or bad. That is not where you find yourself. In Philippians, Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity to act. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I know all of you have some plaque in your house that has that verse on it. But did you see the rest of it beforehand? Do you know where Paul is when he's writing this? Prison. That doesn't sound like the greatest circumstances to me. That doesn't sound like somebody who's going to write that. But in all of those circumstances he still has joy that cannot be robbed from him. He has hope that cannot be stolen from him. It is not your circumstances that can rob that. It's losing sight of Jesus and trying to spend all your time keeping up with the Jones. Which, sidebar, who are the Joneses, by the way? I've wondered that for a long time, but there it is. It's losing sight of Jesus Comparing your lawn to your neighbors leads nowhere good. 
You end up striving for what's next and better, never getting there because you're always striving for what's next and what's better and what's next and what's better. Joy, peace, hope, all of that are all fruits of the Spirit in you. What does that mean? That means that it's the work of the Lord in you that brings those to you. You may not be happy. I remember the first day that I walked into this church where I ended up giving my life to Christ. And the words I heard on that Easter Sunday were, you may not be optimistic, but you can have hope because hope is a person and hope is Jesus Christ. It is not your circumstances that define whether you're joyful. I choose joy over happiness any day. It is not your circumstances that can steal that hope, that can steal that next from you. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with his own passions and desires. If you belong to him, you stay close to him, all of those are all for you, all ready and waiting for you. Regardless of what the next person's thing looks like, regardless of whether you get that new car or not, all of that is waiting for you in Christ Jesus. And when you focus on Jesus and the work of the Spirit in your life, these are the things that pour out of your life. If you want peace in the storm, focus on him. If you want hope in a bad circumstance, you focus on him. If you want joy when all seems lost, you focus on him. If you want patience, stop praying for it because he'll give you opportunities to get it. Focus on him. Kindness, focus on him. All of them. You focus on him. Get your target straight. There's nothing inherently wrong with having nice things. Nothing at all. Or wanting a nice trip. I'd love to take my, my wife and my kids to Turks and Caicos. That's what, something that we'd love to go see. Something fancy. But does striving for the next and the nice car and that white picket fence dominate your existence? Is that everything that you're, that you're focused on, that's always trying to get to? It's time to refocus on him rather than everything that's around you. And this is true even about things that are great. I'm going to say something to some of you churchy folk that's going to feel weird, okay? If you're more interested in his kingdom than you are in him, you're missing something. I'm a pastor. Ministry is a good thing. Doing the work of God is a good thing, but if I'm not focused on him doing it, I'm also a pastor's kid, by the way, and I didn't give my life to Christ until I was 26. And in Matthew 7, it says, I, but Lord, I did all of these things in your name. I prophesied. I did all this. I sang. I stood on stage. I led people in worship. And until September 29th of 2007, the Lord will look at me and said, depart from me because I never knew you. You can do all of the right things and still miss the one who's called you to do them. All the right things are not him. I want his kingdom come so bad because he comes with it. Because he's the one who's leading the charge. So focus on Jesus. Secondarily, your identity is not formed by what people around you think. I don't care what you think of me. Can Can I say that crassly for you? When I step into this room, and I lead in worship, I've led worship to some, with a room this size with one person in it. I don't care. I don't sing for you. I sing for him. I lift my voice in worship to him because he's worthy of it. So that's what I do, and it is overflow of the spirit in me that calls me to step forward that calls me to this spot. I am only here. I don't care if you know who I ever am. I'll say it from the other side too. It doesn't matter to me if you know who I am. It matters to me that you know who he is. And since he called me to step onto the stage into this spot, I'm going to lead with everything I have because he has called me to it. That doesn't mean I don't receive thanks from you when you say thank you and for all that I do. 
it's awesome. And that's, this is not, by the way, this is not giving you a pass to be a terrible person. You should still say thank you to people. You should still honor people. You should still tip properly. I was never even a server, and that server, and that's one that I'll die on. Don't go giving our pens and stuff to people if you're going to tip 5%. Get out of here. <laughs> but this is not a pass to be terrible to people and just go, they get their love from Jesus. They don't need it from me. You better shut your mouth because he speaks through his people too. In Galatians it says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Ouch. All you people pleasers in the room, did you read? Did you see what that last part says? If your people pleasing is over top of your trying to get the approval of Christ, you're not his. Get your life refocused. Are you more concerned with likes or doing the will of the one who sent you? Do you feel yourself wasting away under the weight of pleasing others? We all already know this, but guess what? People are fickle. People are real fickle. And they'll tell you one thing one day, and then the next they are off on some other path. And we are a host of unfounded opinions that we gladly share without provocation. That's people. So defining our self-worth and our identity by something that is ever-changing is at best exhausting. Always trying to get someone to look at you, and you end up tired. And you wonder why everybody gets burnt out. If the Lord called you to your job, if the Lord's the one that is leading you forward, if you are doing it in his will and staying close to him, guess what you won't happen at your job? Burnout. You might be tired. There'll be times of, of low energy. There's all that sort of stuff. But if the Lord called you to it, what's the old churchy phrase? Come on, some of you know it. He'll see you through it. When's the base starting? If the Lord brought you to it, he's got the next for you. He's got the steps to take. And you can find yourself free to take those steps in whatever it is you find yourself in if you're sticking close to him. If his voice is the one leading the way, but if you're doing your job waiting for somebody to tell you thank you, they may never do it. If you're waiting around for somebody to give you that promotion, you may never get it. If you're waiting to get that leadership role, if you're waiting and doing all of this stuff to impress somebody, I tell my team all of the time, if you are serving in any of these capacities because you're trying to impress me, just go ahead and stop because you've missed who you're supposed to be working for. I'm not relatively impressed by anybody, so it's going to be pretty hard to do anyway. But if you're doing it serve me, you're serving the wrong person. If you're doing it to serve Alex, you're serving the wrong person. If you're doing it to serve this church, you're serving the wrong thing. You do it because the only well-done, good, and faithful servant that you need is his. Thank you, Amber. It's his. It's the only voice you need. It's the only voice you need. You don't need to spend your time on, was that video funny enough? Was your photo cute enough? Did your kid succeed enough? Was your trip epic enough? Is my waist snatched enough? You don't need to spend any time with any of that. You spend your time close to him. There's nothing wrong with people liking you. There's nothing wrong with liking to be funny. There's nothing wrong with loving people or liking people, wanting to be surrounded by people. Nothing wrong with wanting to be helpful. But when it's out of our own effort, you're going to find yourself really tired trying to gain that approval. So we've already said it numerous times. What's the answer? Your identity is secure in what Jesus says about you. That's it. 
Jeremiah says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Psalm says, you are, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. First Corinthians says, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You, the Lord of the universe, decided was worthy of sacrificing that which did not need to be sacrificed. He gave up his son for you, so let him speak to you on that for a moment. That he calls you his. You were bought with a price. And then in Isaiah it says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who hope in the Lord. He is all you need. If the Holy Spirit has spoken truth to you, let me tell you something hard again. Disagreement is disobedience. Who am I to look the God of the universe in the eye and say, you know what? You're wrong. I'm right. I know me better. I didn't form my own hair on my own head. He did. Who am I to tell him otherwise? And that's truth that you need as well because he is speaking truth over you all the time. Are you close enough to him to listen to it? Are you close enough to him to hear it? Are you close enough to him to act on it? I'm not naturally a confident person. You may be a little shocked to hear that I'm actually by how I am. My nature is actually as an introvert and as pretty insecure. That's my norm. And that's the norm I've battled my entire life. But him in me, if you see me step forward, it's because of him in me. The confidence I have is because he placed it there. I'm what you might call a generalist. I'm good at lots of different things, which a lot of times means I'm not an expert at anything. Used to hate that about myself. But you know what being a generalist makes me? Pretty good leader. Because I can see things from lots of different places, and it's something that he did in me. And I don't say that from a cocky place. I say that because it's the Lord that transformed that in me. And it's the Lord that showed me, like, I, I know two things. One, I'm a pretty good singer. Two, I'm a pretty good photographer and videographer. When you spend six years with one of the best photographers in the city as his side-by-side -side guy, guess what? The Lord places you in some places to grow in some, some things. But I only know that's true about myself because he's the one who did it. Because my natural state is self-deprecation. My natural state is being lower than. And you hear sermons all the time about pride. Insecurity is just the other side of the coin because it's still all about you. But the Lord doing his work in me is what transforms me. Let's be vulnerable for again for a second. This last two weeks has not been great. This week has been less than not great. This morning has been less than not great, not great. But the Lord still told me to come. The Lord still told me to do what he's called me to do. And it's the Lord in me that lets me keep going. So while I receive your thanks, I do. I need his. While I receive your encouragement, I need his. So how about I reintroduce myself? My name is John Headley. I am a son of the Most High. I'm his and there doesn't need to be anything else said. 
because he says all that we need. So you can spend your time wallowing through the dregs of social media if you'd like. Or you can go to the one who has all the answers to all the questions and all the wanderings of your heart that you may have and fall at his feet. Because while you spend all your time all your, on your slopes, it is level at the foot of the cross. You can just drop to your knees right there. Just worship at his feet and find everything in your life transformed. I can't do that for you. Your spouse can't do that for you. Your pastor cannot do that for you. All that we can do is point you to the one who can. And then you let you accept it. You may find yourself here today, someone who's received Jesus in your heart, but you feel yourself falling off, wandering, struggling, not sure what's next, feeling very out in the wilderness. He's got a word for you. He's got closeness to his heart for you. He's never far away. You just ain't looking. And you may be in here today going, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about because you've never actually stepped into a relationship with him. You could have been, you could be who I was, have spent so much time in ministry. You have done all the youth events. You have gone down to the altar 50,000 times. You've led worship. You've stood on stage. You may have preached standing in this room. You have been a pastor yourself. And you struggle right now going, am I going to get up there? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Or is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant? I'm not sure. You can be sure. You can put all that stuff behind you. You can stop worrying about what people are going to say. I've already been baptized before. Don't matter if you didn't give your life to him first. It's just some water. But I spent 40 years in ministry. Don't matter if you're not his. I've been a, I've been a Christian all my life. There's no such thing. Your parents' faith is not your own. So what if today is the day that you have the opportunity for the first time to look Jesus square in the eye and say, I surrender? You guys bow your heads with me. Jesus, we know that you are here. As you say, where two or more are gathered, there you will be. And we are here this morning crying out to you. Needing a touch of your spirit, whether it's for the 50th time because we can always turn and run back to you or whether it's for the first time because we've never done it before. Jesus, will you help us to seek you? Will you help us to hear your voice? Will you speak so clearly to us through the noise that is either produced around us or that we produce in and of ourselves. We need you, your word, your heart, your cross, your hope, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your self-control. We need you speaking in us and then through us. For all of those who have never entered into a relationship with you, Jesus, will you help them to run to you? If today is their day, will you help them not to leave this space before that is clear with you?
Jesus, make this place so overwhelmingly full of your spirit today that it cannot be missed. It's in your powerful name we pray. Amen.